My name is Jack Carver, and this happened to me on October 23rd, 1999. I still remember it like it was yesterday. You see, I don't work your average 9 to 5. No spreadsheets or water cooler gossip for me. I'm part of a specialized unit, a unit most people think only exists in bad horror movies. We hunt the things that go bump in the night, the creatures hidden in the shadows of myth and whispered rumors. The call came in late. A string of disappearances up in the Pacific Northwest, centered around a sprawling stretch of old-growth forest. Hikers going missing, search and rescue teams finding nothing but scraps of half-eaten trail mix. Locals started whispering about Bigfoot, but that never sat right with me. There's a scent to those big fellas, a musk that lingers for days after they've moved on. This had a different stink to it, cold, metallic, like the air right before a lightning storm. I shipped out with my team, Williams, a grizzled veteran with more confirmed kills under his belt than any of us, and Thompson, a bright-eyed rookie fresh out of the academy and itching to prove herself. We landed in a logging town on the edge of the forest, the kind of place where everyone knows your name and a stranger turning up raises eyebrows. We flashed some fake badges, said we were with fish and wildlife, and hunkered down in a seedy motel to plan our first sweep. The terrain was brutal. Thick, ancient trees blocked out the sunlight. The forest floor was a tangled carpet of moss and ferns, every fallen log a potential hiding place. We moved slow, scanning every inch of our surroundings for any sign of our quarry. It felt like the woods themselves were watching us, holding their breath. By the third day, we still hadn't found anything resembling a trail. The locals were right about one thing. Whatever was out there was smart. It left no tracks, no scat, no broken branches. The tension gnawed at us. Williams was getting twitchy. Thompson was starting to doubt herself. And even I was beginning to wonder if we were chasing shadows. Then came the break. A flicker of movement in the undergrowth, a flash of something... wrong. It moved too fast to be an animal, too upright for a bear. We gave chase, adrenaline pumping through our veins. The trees thinned, giving way to a rocky clearing... That's when we saw it. It was tall, at least seven feet at the shoulder, with skin a mottled gray-green, stretched tight over bulging muscles. Its head was long and narrow, its eyes black pits that reflected no light. But it was the arms that made my blood run cold. They were too long, tipped with sickle-like claws that gleamed in the filtered sunlight. The creature didn't roar or charge. It just tilted its head, studying us with a chilling intelligence. Something about those eyes. They weren't just animal eyes. There was a cunning in them, a calculating coldness that set my teeth on edge. Williams was the first to act. He raised his rifle, the sharp crack of the shot echoing through the trees. The creature jerked, a spray of inky black blood staining the rocks behind it. But it didn't go down. Instead, it turned towards us, and a scream tore from its throat, a high-pitched keening wail that sent shivers down my spine. It was moving, a blur of gray and claws, impossibly fast. Thompson didn't stand a chance. One swipe of its claws and she was down, her scream cut brutally short. Williams and I opened fire. Our bullets found their mark, peppering the creature with holes. Thick black blood splattered the ground, the metallic tang of it hanging heavy in the air. The creature staggered, roared, not in pain, but in rage. Then it whirled, vanishing back into the trees with unnerving speed. The forest fell silent, but the echo of that horrible scream still hung in my ears. We found Thompson where she had fallen. What the creature left behind was barely recognizable. My stomach churned and I fought the urge to vomit. Williams didn't say a word. He just looked at me, his face etched with a grim determination. I saw the same reflection in his eyes as I felt in my own gut. This was far from over. We patched ourselves up, radioed for backup then set to tracking the creature. The blood trail was easy to follow at first, but then it petered out, like the thing had simply melted back into the forest. The arrival of backup was less reassuring than I'd hoped. More grunts and camo gear, the same wide-eyed confusion we'd all worn a few days ago. Command set up a perimeter, containment protocols ringing in my ears like a bad joke. Contain what, exactly? A whirlwind with teeth? Williams vanished into the command tent, leaving me to babysit the newbies. He emerged an hour later, face drawn. We got orders, he said, 
his voice low. They want us to lure it in. The plan was insane, as most plans involving monsters tend to be. I'd be the bait. It took every ounce of my willpower not to argue, to yell about Thompson and how we were outmatched. But some battles aren't won with shouting. That night I lay in the center of the clearing, rifle in my sweating hands, heart pounding against my ribs. The forest was alive with whispers and rustles, every shadow holding the potential for those black, unblinking eyes. It came not with a charge, but materialized from the darkness like a conjuring trick. One moment the clearing was empty, the next, it stood there, studying me. Moonlight glinted off its claws. I squeezed the trigger, the gunfire shattering the forest's silence. The creature flinched, a spray of black blood, but then it was moving, too damn fast. My shots went wild as I scrambled back, scrabbling for my sidearm. Then Williams was there, his rifle spitting fire, the creature finally roaring in true pain. Branches snapped, the ground trembled as it thrashed and twisted, wounded but far from dead. Backup converged, flashlights slicing through the night, more bullets tearing into the creature. It twisted, not towards us, but deeper into the trees. It moved with a desperation that sent a chill through me. Was it retreating? Or leading us somewhere? The command truck was a fortress of flashing lights. Medics swarmed what was left of the creature, strapping it to a gurney, shouting technical terms I didn't understand. Its ragged breaths echoed in the night, a horrible, wheezing counterpoint to the organized chaos. William stood near the rear of the truck, his expression unreadable. You did good, Carver, he said, offering me a hand. Relief warred with unease, a sour taste in my mouth. A flicker of movement in the open truck doors. Not the creature, but something small, huddled in the shadows. It looked like a child, thin limbs wrapped tightly around itself, staring out with those same dead black eyes. My voice failed me before I could speak, a strangled gasp caught in my throat. Williams's grip tightened. Don't, he warned. But the order was unnecessary. We both knew. There wasn't anything we underscore could underscore do. The truck doors slammed shut. Engines roared, and like that they were gone. The government-sanctioned monster truck leaving only the tang of blood and exhaust in the cold forest air. The aftermath was a whirlwind of paperwork and debriefings. Euphemisms like asset containment and national security risks were thrown around while I tried to scrub the image of that small, terrified figure from my mind. Thompson's face floated before me as I filled out reports with hands that still shook. Officially, the forest incident was blamed on a bear attack. Hikers were warned, trails were closed, the world moved on as it always does. But Williams and I, we knew. We'd seen the truth behind the carefully papered over lies. Monsters are real, the government knows. And sometimes the people who get called in to handle things, the ones with badges and guns and brave faces, they don't make it out with their humanity intact. They offered me a promotion, a cushy desk job away from the front lines. I turned it down, told them I'd rather be out in the field, facing what might be lurking in the darkness head on. Because the truth is scarier than any monster I've hunted. There are things the government can contain, and then there are things they unleash. And sleep doesn't come easy when you don't know which kind is waiting for you out there in the shadows. My name is Lucas Kane, and this happened to me in the fall of 2010. Wife still teases me how that backpacking trip was a little wilder than I'd promised. Thing is, she isn't wrong. I work off the books for the government, a specialized kind of wildlife control unit. Mostly it's dealing with the rumors the internet cooks up, mutant fish, rabid bears, the usual. But every so often you get a call that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. This time, it was the Ozarks. Locals muttering about missing livestock, campers disappearing. Nothing solid to go on, half-whispered stories passed around campfires about shadows in the woods, glowing eyes. Team was me, Flynn, and Walsh. Flynn, ex-marine, the stoic type with a mean right hook. Walsh, our wildlife expert, quiet but could identify scat a mile off. Me? Let's just say I'd seen things that made the average bear attack look like a walk in the park. 
The Ozarks are old, rugged, the kind of place that feels like it's got secrets buried under centuries of leaves. First day was recon talking to folks. Standard procedure, get a feel for the lay of the land and sift truth from tall tale. One old-timer, farmer who claimed he'd been in these hills his whole life, finally gave us something halfway concrete. A cave system a few ridges over, history of strange happenings even before the disappearances. Said it was a bad place, told us to leave well enough alone. We had our target. Next morning we geared up and hiked out. Flynn checked the GPS tracker. Looks like about three miles through the woods. Walsh pointed to some old tracks near the trail. Whatever made those isn't anything I'm familiar with. Claws. Big ones. I exchanged a look with Flynn. Not what we wanted to find. The trees thinned as we got closer. Sun barely sliced through the canopy, giving the forest a dim, watchful feel. We switched to hand signals now. Flynn took point. Walsh brought up the rear, a tranquilizer rifle at the ready. The cave came into view, a jagged maw in the hillside. Thick, choking smell hung in the air, old blood and something rancor. Walsh swore softly and held up a fist. We went to ground, scanning the area. Something was wrong. Too quiet. Even the birds had stopped chirping. Flynn motioned for us to circle around, get a better angle. Then I saw it. The thing was hunched just inside the cave, a dark silhouette against the brighter light beyond. Massive, at least eight feet tall at the shoulder even crouched. Its fur hung in patches, showing raw skin with what looked like pustules or boils. But its head, that was what burned into my memory. Long, wolf-like snout stretched too far, and teeth, a ragged mess of bone jutting at all angles. It lifted its head, sniffing the air. Two eyes flashed open. Not animal eyes, a wrong yellow, slit-pupiled and filled with a terrible intelligence. It saw us. Trank it, Walsh hissed, already bringing up his rifle. Too late. The creature lunged from the cave in a blur of motion. It knocked Walsh aside like a ragdoll, the rifle flying. Thing was fast, impossibly so for its size. Flynn opened fire with his automatic, bullets tearing into its shoulder. No reaction. It grabbed at Flynn, who roared and threw up an arm to block. Claws ripped through his Kevlar vest, tossing him back. I drew my own pistol, firing as I charged forward. Aiming for anything vital was useless. It moved too damn fast. All I could do was distract it. Flynn scrambled back, swearing. He was bleeding badly, arm hanging wrong. I fired again and the creature turned, eyes fixing on me. It let out a hissing snarl and the stench washed over me, nearly making me gag. Walsh was yelling something, but all I could focus on was that gaping maw and the rank, rotten smell of it. God, so much blood, those teeth. The gunshot cracked through my stunned haze. Walsh, lying sprawled but rifle steady, had managed a clean shot, right through one of its eyes. The creature roared, the sound echoing through the trees and staggered back. Into the cave, Walsh shouted. I blinked, finding my voice. Flynn! We hauled Flynn up, half stumbling, half dragging him towards the cave. Thing was thrashing around, wounded but far from done. We needed cover, needed to regroup. We lunged into the blessed darkness of the cave. Flynn groaned, each ragged breath sending a fresh spike of pain through him. The creature was howling outside, a terrifying soundtrack to our desperate scramble. We gotta go deeper, Walsh gasped, flashlight beam bouncing wildly over rough cavern walls. I fumbled for my own light. Flynn slumped against a rock, face white. Legs busted. I ain't going nowhere. Despair clawed at me. Flynn down. Cave a dead end. We were trapped. I started reloading my pistol, hands shaking. The howling cut off abruptly. In the silence that followed, we could hear it snuffling outside the cave entrance. It knew we were in here. It was waiting. Walsh swore. Tranks won't last forever thing wakes up, we're done. He was right. No backup coming out here, no miracle escape. That's the thing about this job. The part they never explain at orientation. Sometimes the boogeyman is real, and sometimes you're just the next course on the menu. Give me the rifle, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. You two get deeper in. Find somewhere to hide. 
Like hell, Flynn growled, gritting his teeth as he tried to staunch the blood flow from his shredded arm. I ain't leaving you as monster chow. Walsh hesitated, that familiar torn look on his face, the biologist wanting to run, the man knowing it was pointless. The thing outside let out a low, guttural growl. It was coming in. Go, I said, shoving the rifle into Walsh's hands. I'll give you some time. They argued, of course, but fear's a good motivator, and seconds later, the beams of their flashlights were bobbing away into the depths of the cave. I crouched near the entrance, raised my gun, and took a steadying breath. This was it. One final stand, a last desperate act of defiance against the impossible. The first shadows flickered at the cave mouth. The creature squeezed inside, its mangled eye milky in the gloom. The other glowed, fixing on me. Lowering its head, it stalked forward. I fired. Once, twice, aiming for the center of its hulking form. The bullet stung it, drew roars of fury, but the damn thing kept coming. It lunged. I barely dodged, rolling aside as the claws raked the air where I'd just been. Scrambling back, I fired again. My shots connected, but they were mosquito bites to this beast. It roared and charged again. This time I wasn't fast enough. A searing pain ripped through my side as a claw caught me. I slammed against the cave wall, my gun flying from my grasp. Vision blurring, I saw the creature loom over me, its maw opening, teeth dripping. Then a different kind of roar echoed through the cave. A blinding flash of light, the smell of burning fur. The creature recoiled, screeching, its good eye wide with confusion. Walsh. The tranquilizer rifle. He'd come back. My vision swam. Flynn's battered form was pulling himself up beside Walsh, his one good arm wrapped around something. A grenade? The creature, enraged and disoriented, stumbled forward. Flynn swore and hurled the grenade at its feet. I couldn't look away, some part of me already knowing how this would end. The explosion was deafening. Rock crumbled. Dust choked the air. When I could see again, half the cave had collapsed. The creature was gone, crushed or buried, I couldn't tell. And Flynn, well, let's just say I don't remember much after that. They found us eventually. Special forces or some black ops unit. All hard faces and efficient questions. Extracted us, patched us up. But there was no celebration, no relieved handshakes. I got the standard debriefing. The thinly veiled threats. National security, they droned. You understand? Sure, I get it. Can't have monsters running around in the news creating panic. Easier to cover it up, dismiss us as delusional. Walsh quit soon after. Said he had enough of things lurking in the shadows. I couldn't blame him. Some days I get the same itch to walk away, build a normal life somewhere far from any damn woods. But then I remember Flynn. The way he looked at me right before he pulled that pin. There's a price for the truth. A cost that most people never have to pay. My wife thinks I came back from the Ozarks a different man. She's not wrong. Thing is, sometimes the monsters aren't the ones with claws. Sometimes they wear suits, give orders, and bury the evidence. And they're the ones we're left to fight. My name is Jason Cole, and this happened to me on October 12, 1997. I work in a specialized field you might call us monster hunters. That's the closest way to describe it, though there's paperwork involved that makes the job title more boring than that. It's hush-hush work for obvious reasons. I know it sounds crazy, but trust me, there are things out there that the general public doesn't need to know about. This particular assignment was out in Washington State, near the town of Forks. Not much to do out there besides logging and enduring the constant rain, but that's the kind of place we thrive. Remote. Our intel suggested rumors of a series of disappearances. Hikers and campers vanishing with very little in the way of evidence. Now we get sent on a whole lot of wild goose chases. Most of those disappearances turn out to be misadventure or plain old foul play among fellow humans. But every once in a while something in the report suggests... something else. That's where my team comes in. There were four of us on the mission. Myself, the field leader, Riley, our animal expert, Garcia, the tactician, and Wilson, young and inexperienced but enthusiastic. We arrived in town a couple of days before starting the real work. 
The idea was to blend in and scope out the terrain. Small towns make that tough. Within a day, everybody in the greasy diner seemed to know we were new faces, asking questions about the missing persons. Night two, we finally decided to get out into the woods. We're a cautious bunch. Night ops give us an edge, even with our fancy night vision gear. This particular spot was a few hours' drive from Forks, along logging roads before we hit a trail and started hiking. It was the last known location of a missing logger. Now, it hadn't been a clean disappearance, even by our standards. There was, well, let's just say a lot of blood and leave it at that. We reached the area a little before midnight. The moon was out, which always makes things a bit trickier. We spread out, covering as much ground as we could quietly. The forest was dead silent, not so much as a squirrel. I started walking, scanning the ground and tree line systematically. I'd done this a hundred times, but that prickle up your spine never goes away, especially not in a place so isolated. Something caught my eye, a flash of movement high up in a tree. At first, I assumed it was my imagination, or more likely an owl or something, but I kept my eyes on the spot. My skin crawled. Then it moved again, this time clear as day. It was a figure, large and dark against the moonlight, hunched over a branch. For a split second, I thought, hell, is that a bear? Then I saw the eyes. They shone back at me, not like any animal. They were yellow, slit pupils, intelligent. Panic flared inside me, but years of training kicked in. I dropped into a crouch, signaled alert to the others with a hand gesture. I could hear them moving closer, converging on my position. The thing watched, unmoving. It had to know we were there. We formed a rough semicircle, weapons trained on the figure, though my gut told me our standard-issue rifles weren't going to do much if this thing decided to attack. Garcia broke the silence with a whispered command, Identify yourself. The thing in the tree stayed silent. Then, ever so slowly, it stood. Jesus, it was tall. Taller than a man should be and inhumanly thin. Its limbs were long, too long, and its movements were jerky and unnatural. My mind raced. Was it even real? Was I hallucinating? That thing, whatever it was, it dropped from the tree branch like it weighed nothing. It landed with an inhuman thud, crouched like some predatory spider, those yellow eyes still fixed on us. Identify yourself, Garcia demanded again, voice tighter now. I don't know who fired first. It might have been Wilson. In the blink of an eye, the thing was on him. There was a blur of motion, a scream, a sickening crunch. Then Wilson was gone, vanished like a magician's trick. Just a pool of blood remained on the forest floor. We opened fire, unloading our magazines into the creature. It hissed and twitched, but rounds seemed to pass right through it. I caught a glimpse of its face in the strobing light of our gunfire, sunken cheeks, taut, translucent skin, a jagged row of teeth. Then it was gone, faded into the trees like smoke. There was just silence again, except for Garcia sobbing and the smell of blood and gunpowder hanging heavy in the night air. And that was just the beginning. The aftermath was chaos, pure, unadulterated chaos. Our calm, practiced ops planning flew out the window. Garcia was a mess, a blubbering shell of his usual tactical self. I wasn't much better, the image of Wilson disappearing into, whatever that had been, seared into my brain. But I was the field leader. Duty demanded action. We had to get out of there. I patched Garcia up with what little medical supplies we had. His wounds were superficial, the shock far deeper. We left Wilson behind. No way to carry him. No way to explain him to the authorities. We didn't even look for a body. It didn't seem real, somehow. Huddled together, we stumbled back to our vehicle. Every snapping twig sent a jolt of terror through me. I kept expecting that unnatural figure to burst from the darkness, its eyes glowing, its limbs reaching. We made it back to town somehow, battered and demoralized. Our first priority was to contact HQ. Even with the secure lines, it was a hell of a story to relay. What we knew, what we'd seen, what we'd done, or rather failed to do. They dispatched a cleanup crew masquerading as some kind of hazmat team. Perks of being a government-sanctioned group messes can be neatly covered up. 
Our team was disbanded on the spot. Discharged, medical records scrubbed, the whole nine yards. Garcia took it the worst. He spiraled, started ranting about government conspiracies and monsters hiding in plain sight. They locked him up. A psychiatric ward was better than a jail cell. They offered me a desk job, pushing papers in some windowless office. But I couldn't live with myself if I just... retired. After the initial shock wore off, something turned hard and angry inside of me. If the world thought these things were myths, then fine. I'd be the hunter in the shadows, a one-man crusade against the creatures that lurked on the fringes. It wasn't easy. I spent years scraping together resources, tracking down leads that were mostly whispered rumors and internet conspiracy theories. But I got better, smarter. I learned how to vanish, how to live off the grid. I built up a small arsenal beyond what the government had issued me. Silver bullets from melted-down jewelry. Custom knives with weird occult symbols. It felt insane even to me sometimes. Then came the break I'd been hunting for. I caught wind of a similar cluster of disappearances up in Alaska. Small town stuff. Hunters and fishermen vanishing without a trace. Their wrecked campsites leaving behind more questions than answers. Same pattern, which in my book, meant it was probably the same damn species we'd encountered in Washington. I traveled there under a false name, a rugged drifter looking for odd jobs in a land that attracts such folks. It turned out luck was on my side. One of the locals, an old Inuit man, noticed me casing the woods and took pity, or perhaps had his own suspicions. He told me stories, hushed whispers around a campfire about the Kalupalik. Old legends, he said, but he swore he'd seen something out on the ice. Something large, humanoid, but not human. It was thin evidence, but it was all I needed. I spent weeks hunting those desolate ice fields. It was harsh, brutal work, and the isolation gnawed at me. But I refused to give in. That thing, whatever it was, it had taken Wilson. It had ruined Garcia's sanity and likely the lives of countless others. It needed to be stopped. One frozen afternoon, I saw it. A dark shape hunched over a seal carcass, its movements inhuman despite its resemblance to a man. I took aim, my hands steady, my breath held tight in my chest. The rifle bucked in my shoulder. The bullet found its mark, but the creature hardly reacted. I fired again and again until it finally slumped to the ice, its yellow eyes fading. I approached cautiously. It was bigger up close. Its features were almost skeletal, its skin a grotesque mottled gray. The mouth was all wrong, a jagged maw filled with needle-like teeth. I felt a wave of nausea and relief all at once. Not the satisfaction of a hunter killing its prey, but the grim resolve of someone who knows there's more work to be done. Victory was fleeting. In the days that followed, I found other carcasses. Bear, caribou, torn apart in a way no predator I knew would manage. My creature was patient, strategic even. But it was also leaving a trail, an unintentional invitation for a persistent hunter like me. I followed that trail further and further into the frozen wastes. The clues became sparser, my supplies dwindling. But something drove me forward, a burning hatred mixed with a stubborn, desperate hope. My journey led me to a hidden cave network, slick with ice and smelling faintly of decay. And there in the shadows, more of those yellow eyes gleamed. Not one creature, but a whole tribe. What happened next is a blur. There was gunfire, echoing in the icy tunnels. There was blood, some of it mine. There were screams that weren't quite human. And there was that terrible, loping run back into the blinding white wilderness. The knowledge that I hadn't stopped anything. They were still out there. I had failed. And yet perhaps had won the tiniest glimmer of information that might, hopefully, save someone else someday. I don't know how I made it back to civilization. I have vague memories of stumbling into an isolated village, collapsing, and then being airlifted to a hospital. When I finally regained full consciousness, it was to news that sent a chill down my spine far worse than anything the Arctic wind could have done. News of disappearances near Forks, Washington. The cycle had begun again.
My name is Ben Mason, and this happened to me in August of 2014. I've spent most of my life working outdoors, first as a park ranger, then in fire management in the sprawling forests of Oregon. The work is tough but honest. Now I'm part of something more, something you won't find on any government website. It started with the wildfires, a devastating season in the Rogue River Siskiyou Wilderness, one of the most rugged, remote stretches left in the lower 48. We were told to expect the usual issues, aggressive wildlife displaced by the flames. But on the fire lines, there was something else, something watching us from the charred tree line. Rangers whispered stories about sightings of figures, too tall, too fast to be any animal. Reports trickled up to my unit. Officially, they were dismissed as stress-induced hallucinations. I wasn't so sure. A few weeks after things had calmed down, I got the call. A summons to a compound deep in the forest, disguised as an old logging camp. That's where I met the others. There was Jenner, ex-military, as hard and silent as the rifle he carried. There was Torres, a tech whiz armed with more electronic gadgets than a spy movie. And leading us was Walker, a no-nonsense man with eyes that had witnessed things that would shatter most people's sanity. We were officially designated a wildlife incident response team, a cover story for the public. But the truth we hunted was something else entirely. Cryptids, creatures of folklore, the things people whisper about around campfires. And with the rash of sightings during those wildfires, the higher-ups couldn't risk ignoring the possibility anymore. Our first assignment brought us back to the wilds of the Siskiyou. A lone hiker had been reported missing days earlier. No trace. Search parties had scoured the area and found nothing. The terrain was rough, easy to disappear into if you didn't know what you were doing. But this hiker was experienced. We went deeper than the search teams had dared, pushing through dense undergrowth. Walker scanned the scorched ground for tracks while Jenner silently watched our backs. The forest here seemed unnaturally quiet. Then Torres stopped, his brow furrowed. Thermal anomaly, thirty yards out, he muttered, his eyes fixed on a tablet. Something big. We followed his pointing finger, rifles raised, towards a stand of blackened trees. At the base of the largest tree, a cave mouth gaped at us like a ragged wound in the earth. Walker made a swift hand motion, and we spread out, approaching cautiously. The smell hit us first, a rotten, metallic tang I'd never encountered before. Torres peered into the darkness, the scan of his thermal equipment casting an eerie red glow across his face. It's in here, he whispered. Then a noise from the depths, low, guttural, like nothing human. We tensed. Suddenly it burst from the cave entrance, a blur of dark fur and gleaming teeth. We barely had time to react before it snatched up Torres and dragged him screaming into the shadows. Gunfire erupted. Jenner and I blindly shot into the darkness, flashes illuminating the cavern walls and the creature's hulking form. It moved impossibly fast, even burdened by Torres's limp body. A roar of pain, then... silence. We rushed forward, flashlights cutting through the gloom. At first, all we saw was a trail of splattered blood leading deeper into the cave. Torres, Walker called out, his voice ragged. There was no reply, only the relentless drip of water echoing in the darkness. We exchanged grim looks. We had to go after him. We ventured into the cave, rifles at the ready, the damp earth chilling beneath our feet. The tunnel wound deeper, narrowing until we were forced to crouch. The air grew thick and musty. Then we saw the glow twin points of reflected light ahead. Our beams swept upwards, revealing a massive creature hunched in a large, hollowed-out chamber. It was at least eight feet tall at the shoulder, crouched on powerful haunches. Coarse black fur covered its body, and the eyes, reflecting the light, burned with a chilling, predatory intelligence. It clutched Torres's lifeless body in one clawed hand, taking ravenous bites. Blood was splattered all over the cave floor. For a moment we froze, paralyzed by a primal fear. This thing was beyond any of our training, any experience out in the wild. Then Walker's voice cut through the terrified silence. Fire! We let loose a volley of shots. The creature screeched in fury, dropping Torres's mangled body. 
It lunged, moving with shocking speed despite its bulk. We retreated, scrambling backwards, barely avoiding its thrashing claws. The thing stalked us through the tunnels, its roar reverberating against the rock walls. We fired wildly, more out of desperation than hope, the confined space amplifying the deafening gunshot blasts. Luck, blind, frantic luck, was our only salvation. A few bullets found their mark striking the creature. Icor, thick and black, oozed from the wounds, stinging our nostrils with its acrid stench. Enraged, the creature charged, slamming into the tunnel wall with bone-jarring force. Rocks tumbled down, and for a horrible second, I thought the entire cave was about to collapse on us. We pushed deeper, reaching a fork in the tunnels. Split up, Walker yelled, already sprinting down the left branch. Jenner and I took the right, our boots splashing through puddles of chilling underground water. Panic fueled our flight, pushing us on despite the burning pain in our lungs. Behind us, a crash echoed, followed by a frustrated howl. Walker had let it off our trail. We exchanged a grim look of understanding. He was buying us time. A surge of adrenaline propelled us onwards. We burst out of the cave system into the blinding daylight. The Siskiyou foothills sprawled around us, lush and deceptively peaceful. We collapsed to the ground, sucking in great gulps of fresh air. Above us, a helicopter appeared, its rotors churning the air. Walker's face appeared in the doorway, drawn and tight with tension. He gestured urgently for us to board. As we hauled ourselves into the copter, I risked a look over my shoulder. The trees below seemed to tremble, but the creature didn't emerge. Back at the compound, it was a blur of debriefings, medical tests, and grim silences. We didn't speak of Torres or of Walker's sacrifice. It was an unspoken agreement, a way to keep what sanity we had left. Instead, we poured over the data, the sensor readouts, the tattered remains of Torres's equipment. The creature was big, fast, incredibly strong. It had an almost uncanny ability to avoid our thermal detection. And it was smart. In the weeks that followed, the creature became an obsession. The images of Torres's mangled body were burned into my retinas. The mission reports I submitted were meticulously detailed, fueled by a desire for both understanding and revenge. They sent us out again, back into the wilds. We tracked the creature, a ghost in the forests. It was always one step ahead, leaving behind only the occasional bloody carcass and a palpable sense of being watched, hunted. We laid traps, sophisticated ones designed with Torres's salvaged tech. Weeks went by, nothing. It was starting to feel like either the creature had moved on, or more chillingly, that it was smarter than any trap we could devise. Then, a glimmer of hope. A ranger reported an unusual sighting on the other side of the Siskiyou range. Grainy camera footage showed a massive dark shape, hulking and bipedal. We were dispatched immediately. Arriving at the location carved a fresh knot of dread into my gut. This place had the same unnerving stillness as the other sites the creature visited. We deployed the new trap, an electrified net that Torres had designed before. Before. And we waited. Days stretched into sleepless nights. The forest seemed to watch our every move. One morning, the silence was broken by the whine of the net's power surge, followed by a bone-rattling roar of fury. We raced towards the sound. There, thrashing against the restraints of the net, was the creature. It looked even more monstrous in the unforgiving daylight, its claws raking at the net, its teeth gnashing. I raised my rifle. This was it. Revenge. Closure an end to the constant lurking fear. Jenner was beside me, his own rifle leveled, his hand steady. Then, Walker's voice blared on the radio. Hold your fire, I repeat, hold your fire! Confusion and anger surged inside me. Didn't he see what this thing had done? What it had taken? Then the creature did something unexpected. It stopped struggling, its gleaming eyes fixed directly on us. It wasn't the mindless fury of a cornered animal. It was... intelligence. Calculation. Walker reached us first, his face unreadable. At his side were two civilians, a man and woman dressed in suits that screamed, Government. We're taking over from here, the man declared. His voice was sharp, authoritative, brooking no argument. Taking over? 
Jenner snarled. We've been tracking this thing. Stand down, soldier, the woman snapped. Your mission is terminated. We could only watch, helpless fury choking us, as agents swarmed the site. They sedated the creature, loaded it into a reinforced vehicle, and vanished back into the forest. We weren't given answers, only vague orders to pack up camp and report for new assignments. The questions burned inside me. Why intervene? What did the government want with the creature? Walker gave us nothing, leaving us with a lingering sense of betrayal on top of our grief and frustration. The aftermath is something I live with every day. I see Torres's face whenever I close my eyes. I walk on trails, looking over my shoulder. They transferred me to the East Coast, as far from the Siski use as they could. A desk job now, pushing papers on threats I'm not allowed to fight. I hear about sightings, reports that sound hauntingly familiar. They keep those hidden from public view, swept under official rugs. And the creature? It's out there or in a lab somewhere, and every day I wonder, what are they doing to it, and what or who is next? My name is Derek Mason, and this happened to me on October 13th, 1998. Single dad at the time, raising a teenage daughter, just trying to get by. Then the government comes knocking with an offer. Decent pay, travel, and the chance to do something, well, different. See, the unit I worked for, they handled the cases no one else wanted to touch. They called it wildlife conflict resolution. The truth was, we hunted things that weren't meant to exist. October 98, they sent us into the backwoods of the Appalachian Mountains. Locals swore there was something huge in the woods, tearing up cattle, creeping close to homes at night. The team was the usual crew, me, grizzled veteran, Jensen, bright kid fresh out of the academy, and Torres, our resident skeptic, who swore everything could be explained by bad moonshine and bored locals. We set up base camp in a remote valley, surrounded by thick pine forests and jagged peaks that scraped the sky. The Appalachians have an ancient feel to them, a sense of secrets buried deep beneath the roots of those old trees. We spent the first few days doing the routine stuff, checking tracks, questioning terrified farmers, that kind of thing. Found some massive paw prints, definitely not any kind of bear I knew of. The locals kept muttering about old legends, things that made my skin prickle, but I'd seen enough weirdness to know better than to completely write it off. Jensen was getting excited, Torres was getting annoyed, and I was getting that sinking feeling in my gut. That feeling that tells you things are about to go south, fast. And then, the noises started. At night, at first. Screams echoing through the trees, inhuman howls that raised the hair on the back of my neck. We'd shine spotlights into the darkness, catch glimpses of glowing yellow eyes, and then, nothing. Decided it was time to go on the offensive. Loaded up on firepower, split into two-man teams, and set out to track the damn thing down. Torres ended up partnered with me, which wasn't ideal. The man had a gift for pissing me off, with his smug insistence that it was probably just a rabid cougar or some such. We were following a set of tracks, bigger than any dogs, when the forest floor changed. The trees thinned, and the earth turned rocky and barren, like nothing could grow in that spot. Jensen sent us a radio message, his voice tight with fear, said they'd followed similar terrain and had found something, something they couldn't describe. I keyed the mic, tried to reach Jensen, but got only static in response. Torres and I exchanged a look. He wasn't smirking anymore. Then we walked into the clearing, and I understood the silence on the radio. The ground was littered with bones, animal bones, human bones, the shattered remains of something I couldn't identify. And in the center of it all stood a pile of rocks, rough-hewn, like an altar built by something monstrous. Jensen's rifle lay abandoned at its base. That's when I saw it. Hunched at the edge of the tree line, it was a solid eight feet tall, covered in shaggy black fur. But the worst part was its face. Like a man's face, twisted into a cruel, hungry grin, its eyes shining with a savage intelligence. It saw us, gave a low growl that set my teeth on edge. Torres whimpered and took a panicked shot. 
The bullet hit the creature's shoulder, and it roared in fury. I yelled at Torres to run, and we sprinted back toward the trees. Didn't stop running until we stumbled back into camp, collapsing against a fallen log, gasping for breath. I radioed headquarters, a rushed, panicked plea for extraction. All I got back was static, like the entire damn world had gone quiet. We huddled in camp until nightfall, every creak and rustle of the forest making us jump. Torres had fallen into a kind of shocked silence, and I was too busy trying not to picture Jensen's fate to offer any comfort. Then, just after midnight, I heard it. A heavy tread circling the camp. That predatory growl, rumbling closer. We were surrounded. Torres broke then, babbling about his family, about how he never should have signed on. I knelt, trying to reason with him, trying to ignore the scratching sounds coming from the darkness. He wasn't listening. Suddenly, with a scream, he bolted from the camp, a blur of a man vanishing into the black woods. I heard his shriek echo through the trees cut brutally short, then the thud of its footsteps heading back in my direction. I swore then. Swore on my daughter's life. Swore on everything I held dear that I wouldn't end up like Jensen or Torres. I gripped my assault rifle, hands slick with sweat, and waited. The creature stalked around the perimeter of the camp, the crackling of branches and its bone-chilling growls a taunting soundtrack to my final stand. Each moment felt like an eternity, my senses hyper-aware of the rustling leaves, the damp scent of the forest, the taste of fear in my mouth. And then it came, bursting from the undergrowth with impossible speed. I opened fire, emptying the magazine in a desperate, blinding barrage. The bullets tore into its flesh, ripping chunks of fur and muscle, but it kept coming, its eyes ablaze with fury. It lunged, and I stumbled backward, rifle flying from my hands. I slammed into a tree trunk, the impact knocking the air from my lungs. The creature loomed over me, breath hot and foul against my skin as I struggled to breathe. Just when I thought it was over, when those yellow eyes were the last thing I'd see in this world, a shot rang out. The creature jerked, a high-pitched whine ripping from its throat. I scrambled backward, heart pounding as it stumbled and fell, thrashing in the dirt. Another shot, and another, and then silence. I blinked, disoriented, as figures stepped out of the darkness. Soldiers armed to the teeth, their faces masked. They moved past me, converging on the creature's body. Radios crackled with clipped orders. I watched, my body numb as they secured the area, gathered evidence, and finally dragged the creature's corpse onto a waiting truck. One of the soldiers approached me, his expression unreadable behind his mask. He asked if I was injured, his voice devoid of concern. I shook my head, then managed to croak out a question. What about the others? Jensen? Torres? The soldier hesitated. There were no other survivors, he said, a hint of something like pity in his tone. I collapsed to my knees then, hit hard with a wave of grief and rage. They picked me up, got me moving, and bundled me into another truck, leaving nothing behind but the lingering scent of gunpowder and the echo of those terrifying growls. The truck jolted into motion, taking me away from that clearing, away from the nightmare I'd survived. But I knew it wasn't over. Not really. The aftermath was a blur. Debriefings, medical exams, a forced relocation. They put me on leave, told me to take time, to heal. But there's no healing from something like that. I kept seeing those glowing eyes, reliving the way Torres had screamed. The government spin machine started to churn, the incident in the Appalachian Mountains was explained away as wild animal attacks, a freak occurrence blown out of proportion by rattled locals. The truth, what I knew, what those soldiers must have known, was buried under layers of red tape and official denials. And then my daughter Jess came home from school one day, talking about the story her friend told. About his uncle who worked in a secret government job, the kind where they covered up real-life monster sightings. I felt a chill run the length of my spine. They were watching me, making sure I kept my mouth shut. It was made subtly clear that if I ever talked, if I went against the official narrative, well, accidents happen, secrets get spilled, and my beautiful girl was awfully vulnerable. I went back to work, kept my head low, did as I was told, and hunted things the world wasn't supposed to believe in. What else could I do? 
The job became my life, a twisted kind of penance. I moved Jess around the country, never letting us put down roots. Told her it was for my job, for her safety. The lies felt like a second skin. Years passed. Jess grew up with a dad who was always half-absent, haunted by ghosts she couldn't see. We drifted apart. I tried, but I couldn't bridge the chasm between us. The chasm built of government secrets and the monsters lurking in the shadows. In the end, the nightmares didn't kill me. The job didn't either, despite its best efforts. It was cancer, quick and brutal, like something ripping into you and tearing away your insides. Funny how the scariest thing I ever faced wasn't some ancient creature risen from legend, but the sterile confines of a hospital room. Jess came to see me one last time before the end. She looked so tired, so broken by the fractured bond between us. Her eyes, the same shade of green as her mother's, held accusation and a desperate plea for the truth I'd spent a lifetime hiding. And on my deathbed, with the life draining out of me and the specter of what I'd become looming over me, I told her. Everything. The creatures. The lies. The things I'd done. I don't know if she believed me. Part of me hopes she didn't. That she could write it off as the ravings of a dying man and not have the chilling truth poison her own life. After I died, she disappeared. Didn't come to the funeral. The government arranged sham of a ceremony. No forwarding address. Just like that, she was gone, and the last piece of the life I had before the monsters was lost to me. Maybe she's out there, hunting the truth, hunting the things that hunted me. Maybe she's made peace with the lies and built a life I can't fathom. Or maybe, just maybe, there's a flicker of belief in her, and she knows the world is a much stranger, darker place than anyone lets on. My name is Caleb Ross, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2012. I work, well, let's just say my job isn't listed on LinkedIn. Some folks in dark suits offered me the gig after a stint in the army left me a bit restless for the quiet life. I'll kill anything with claws or fangs for the right price. That's the simple version. This particular job involved a string of disappearances in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful place. Hikers vanishing into thin air. No blood, no bodies, just abandoned backpacks and half-eaten granola bars. My gut told me it was a mountain lion that had gotten a taste for human flesh. The Park Service wanted it alive for study, which paid better than a trophy for some rich lunatic's wall, so I agreed. I'm good at what I do, but even the best hunters sometimes step in shit. I spent a week in those woods, found tracks, big ones, but nothing recent. Locals swore they heard roars in the night echoing off the peaks, but mountain lions roar to stake out territory, not to lure in prey. That's when the doubts crept in. What was I really tracking out here? Day seven, I made my move. I staked out a fresh kill, a deer carcass, half devoured, high in a remote valley. I set up a hide on the opposite ridge, night vision rifle ready. If it was just a big cat, this was my best chance. As dusk turned to night, the forest took on a different shape. Shadows deepened, every snap of a twig made me jump, but it wasn't the sound of approaching paws that had me tensing, it was the silence. The woods had gone dead quiet. That's when I saw it. A figure slipping through the trees, more shadow than substance. Humanoid in shape, but moving on all fours, weirdly hunched. Its skin seemed to shimmer in the moonlight, pale and hairless. I raised the rifle, finger hovering over the trigger. In the scope's infrared glow, it turned to face me. And Jesus, those eyes. They burned like embers, Filled not with animal instinct, but a cold, calculating intelligence. That wasn't a beast. It was something else entirely. A shiver ran down my spine. I'd heard the stories, things most people dismiss as tall tales told around campfires. The part of me that still believed in monsters, the part I'd tried to bury, screamed at me to get the hell out of there. But I held my ground. I'm no coward, and part of me, a reckless part, burned with a hunter's curiosity. What the hell was that thing? 
It crouched lower, muscles rippling beneath its skin. It studied me, not as a predator sizing up its next meal, but as something older, smarter, assessing a threat. Then it spoke. Not with words exactly, but a guttural sound echoing in my mind, scraping at my sanity. Go away. Hunt elsewhere. This place is mine. It was a warning. And in that terrible, impossible moment, I understood. That thing wasn't an animal I could track and kill. It was far more dangerous than any predator I'd ever faced. I lowered the rifle. Some might call me a fool. But there's a line between bravery and stupidity and I wasn't about to cross it. Slowly, deliberately, I backed away, keeping my gaze locked on the creature. It watched, unmoving, until I disappeared back into the trees. I stumbled down the mountainside, half crazed with a mix of terror and adrenaline. I never looked back. When I reached the ranger station at dawn, I had a story all ready. Mountain lion, too cunning for me to track. I quit the job, walked away without asking for the paycheck. The nightmares started soon after. That thing's eyes burning into mine. The voice in my head, a low rasp of inhuman power. I saw a shrink for a while, tried to convince myself it was all PTSD flashbacks from my time in the sandbox. Didn't work. I know what I saw. Here's the thing. I haven't hunted since. Took a job as a security contractor. Dull as dirt but lets me sleep at night. Sometimes I drive up to Glacier, take a hike, try to convince myself it was just a trick of the light, a hallucination brought on by too much isolation. But deep down, I know the truth. There are things out there far older and more terrible than we can comprehend, things that hide in plain sight, and sometimes, if you're really unlucky, they see you back. Let me tell you, Staring down the barrel of an enemy rifle is nothing compared to the cold, crawling fear that thing left behind. I don't know what it is, or why it let me live. All I know is that somewhere in those mountains, it's still waiting. My name is Caden Harris, and this happened to me on November 7th, 1991. Back then, I worked the kind of job folks don't like to talk about, the kind where you see things, learn things that would break most people. I'm a dad now, got a little girl to protect, so I put that life behind me. But I still remember that fall, up in the remote forests of the Olympic Peninsula. They sent my team in blind. Bunch of hikers vanished without a trace, no remains, no ransom notes, nothing. Standard protocol. Sweep the area, look for any sign of foul play, report back. We were four strong. Me, the point man, Novak, the techie, Jensen, the old-timer, and Wright, the rookie fresh out of training. The Olympic Peninsula is something else. Rainforest so thick the sun barely filters through, old-growth trees like giants, the air always damp and heavy. We made camp near an old logging road, figuring that's where folks would stray from. Days crept by, long and quiet. Set up camera traps, took soil samples, the usual drill. Found nothing out of the ordinary, and that was starting to get weirder than any monster sighting would have been. Then came the noises. At night at first. Low growls echoing in the darkness. Things snapping branches out in the black woods made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The rookie, Wright, started getting spooked. We told him it was probably just a bear, but nobody was really convinced. Not even Jensen, with all his years dealing with the strange and unusual... One morning, Jensen didn't come back from his perimeter check. We found his rifle discarded on the forest floor, but no sign of him. Novak, face pale, showed us his tracker. Jensen's signal just winked off the map. That's when the dread set in, that gut feeling that something was way, way wrong out there. We radioed command. No backup was coming. Not until there was proof of something worth sending in a whole strike team. Great. We were on our own, down a man and facing something that snatched a grown armed veteran without leaving a trace. Novak swore he was picking up movement on his thermal scans, something big, lurking just at the edge of the tree line. I didn't need fancy gadgets to tell me we were being watched. We hunkered down in camp, trying to form a plan. Wright was on the verge of a breakdown, babbling prayers under his breath. The sun started to set, casting long, creepy shadows, 
and tension in the camp ratcheted up to breaking point. Night fell, heavy and moonless. We huddled close to the fire, guns loaded, senses straining out into the darkness. Then I smelled it, a rank, rotten stench, like old meat left in the sun. Wright whimpered and my stomach clenched. And then the thing moved out from the trees. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, stooped like an ape, but with a lean, hungry build. Its skin was leathery, stretched tight over bulging muscles, covered in coarse gray fur. But the worst were the eyes. Cold, intelligent, like something ancient sized us up and decided we were the next course on the menu. I yelled. We opened fire. The bullets ripped into the thing, but it just staggered, roared a challenge that set my teeth on edge. Novak fumbled for a grenade. That's when the thing lashed out, faster than anything its size had any right to be. It snatched right. One second he was there, screaming. The next, just a smear of blood and a tattered piece of his uniform in the flickering firelight. I yelled at Jensen and Novak to fall back. We bolted through the trees, boots slipping on the mossy forest floor, the thing's guttural growls echoing behind us. We didn't stop until we stumbled out onto the logging road, chest heaving, hearts pounding. Then Novak collapsed, choking out, the tracker. Jensen's signal was back on the map. He was moving, fast, deeper into the trees, away from us. I wanted to go after him, but that thing was out there and we were outgunned, outmatched. In that moment, I made the call. Left Jensen out there, radioed for extraction, and told one hell of a lie to the brass about a bear attack. They bought it, or pretended to. Classified the whole damn incident. Never saw Jensen again. Don't know if that thing killed him, or if he's still out there. I left the unit a few years back, moved to the suburbs, started a family. But at night, sometimes I look out the window into the backyard shadows and I swear I feel the weight of those cold eyes on me, watching and waiting. My name is Lucas Thorne, and this happened to me on July 22, 1995. I was a firefighter back then, the kind of guy who ran into burning buildings while everyone else ran out. Adrenaline junkie, maybe a touch reckless. Turns out, useful skills when you end up chasing things that aren't on any wildlife chart. This mess didn't start with fangs or fire. It started with a call about a domestic dispute in the bad part of St. Louis. The kind cops dreaded even in daylight. Me? I figure everyone deserves help when things go sideways. We rolled up to a grimy old house, the lights inside flickering like a bad horror movie. My partner Johnson took the back door, and I kicked in the front. The inside of the place looked like a war zone, furniture overturned, holes punched through the walls, blood splatters everywhere, but no bodies, no sign of struggle beyond the chaos. A noise echoed from upstairs, a harsh choking sound. We crept up, guns drawn the floorboards groaning under our boots. The sounds led to the master bedroom. Slowly, I eased the door open. It was like somebody took nightmares and made them flesh. The man, hell, I don't know if I could call him that anymore, was huge, muscle contorted under papery skin. He moved jerkily, as if his own body were unfamiliar. Worst of all were the eyes. Bloodshot, rolled back in his head, fixated on a corner of the room where there was nothing at all. The man lunged at me with a guttural roar, speed I wouldn't have thought possible. I fired before I even thought, the shots echoing in the small room. He jerked, stumbled, but kept on coming. I could see the holes in his chest leaking a thin, blackish fluid, but he paid them no mind. Johnson barged in then, grabbing my arm and dragging me backward. We tumbled down the stairs and scrambled out the front door, my ears ringing with gunshots and something shrieking that raised the hair on my neck. Barricading the front door bought us seconds. I heard the crashing of wood, saw the monstrous face appear in the shattered window frame, those awful eyes searching. Then, as suddenly as it started, it retreated, the shrieks receding into the summer heat. Shaking, we called it in. Cops, ambulances, the whole circus descended. They found the house trashed, bloodstains everywhere, but no sign of the man-turned-monster. Johnson and I got chewed out, questioned until our teeth ached, then sent home on mandatory leave. 
Nobody believed what we saw. I started doing my own digging. Talked to old priests, folks steeped in urban legends, anyone on the fringes. Turns out the pattern fit. Sudden fits of rage, inhuman strength, sightings of asterisk things asterisk nobody could quite pin down. The deeper I looked, the clearer it became. St. Louis had a problem the official guidebooks didn't acknowledge. The fire department didn't want two guys with PTSD delusions, so I quit. Reconnected with a few buddies from the Marines, guys who wouldn't flinch at the unexplainable. Johnson, he couldn't handle the whispers, what he'd seen, vanished. Probably thinks I'm crazy too. It's a different kind of fight these days. No fire hoses, no axes. It's loading up the van with enough firepower to level a city block, checking police reports for things that don't fit, chasing shadows most folks pretend aren't real. Some nights, I lie awake wondering what happened to Johnson, if those eyes from the window will ever find me. But mostly I think about the other folks out there, the ones who'll stumble into the darkness unprepared. Thing is, somebody's got to stand between them and the monsters. May as well be me.